Okay, so let's jump into week three. And last week we did basically measures of center and measures of spread. And we touched a little bit on what are called um, measures of relative standing. And that's uh, really kind of the, the meat and potatoes this week. And they're just more ways of describing your data. So one of the measures of relative standing is a percentile. And we've already seen, you know, percentages. You guys did a homework question where you found, um, you know, um, what percentage. Well, you found it as a probability that, you know, how many um, measurements were going to be above 0.9. And, it, you know, it came out as 28%. Well, that's pretty close to what a percentile is. Instead of, instead of a raw probability, it's looking at what percentage of your data is below that value. Now here's, here's the rub. Some people and some technologies define a percentile as the data values that are equal or less than the number that you're looking at. And some classify it as strictly less than. And I know that doesn't sound like a big difference, but it can actually make a difference when, for instance, you're trying to find the 90th percentile in your data, which in one case would mean that you scored the same or better than 90% of the people who took this test, let's say their test scores. But in the other case, the other technology would find the score that strictly beat out, right, was better than 90% of the students. And those two results can give you two slightly different numbers. They're not gonna be off by much, but off by a little bit. So it's good to kind of know um, what your technology does, um, you know, if it's gonna be something that you wanna be really precise with, precise with. <clears throat> the empirical rule, we um, will talk about, or you'll see this a lot in this week's homework. And we talked about this before, right? Where if we're in within one standard deviation in both directions of the mean, it's 68% of our data. And then two standard deviations is 95 and three standard deviations is 99.7. And I, I found that nice little picture on um, the internet for you and showed you uh, what it looks like on a normal curve with all the colors and things. Here's a good one. And so there's your visualization of the middle of your data is always the mean, the median, and the mode, right? It's most frequent because it's the tallest point. It's the median because you have exactly 50% below and 50% above. And it's also the mean because every, you can see that it's symmetrical. So every value you have that is, you know, we have this many, because remember the height is how many. So we have this many of this score that's exactly, let's say, a quarter of an inch above. And if we go a quarter inch below, we have the exact same height. So we have the exact same number of things that are the exact same amount below. So the above and the below average each other out and the average ends up becoming the middle. So the mean, median, and mode are all right there in the middle. And if you go one center deviation in both directions, that gets you 68%. You can remember these are approximations. It's pretty darn close to 68, but not precise. So you get 34 in each half. Again, not precise, but close. Then if you go all the way out two of them, you get 95 total. And if you subtract 68 from 95, you get 27. And if you cut 27 and a half, that's where you get 13 and a half here, 13 and a half there. And then if you go out three, you get 99.7, which of course, if you subtract 95 from it, that gives you 4.7. If you divide that in half, you get 2.35 and 2.35. So a lot of times, you'll hear the 68, 95, 99.7, but some people will also refer to it as the 34, 14, two rule. And all they did was they took these numbers and rounded, right? 13 and a half, they rounded up to 14 and 2.35, they rounded down to two. So those are kind of two ways of describing the same thing, but it's the good old empirical rule. And as we talked about last week, it only applies to normal curves. Okay. Um, Data sets with, um, let's look at an example here. We've got a, a mean of 40 and a standard deviation of three. So if we wanna know what range would encompass about 68% of the data, we know we would just go plus and minus that three and we get 37 and 43. Now, 
in actuality, it might be a little bit different depending on, um, you know, how perfectly normal our data is or not perfectly normal, right? And remember, 68 is an approximation. So it could be slightly off. Another display for relative standings is the box plot. And the box plot is just a visual representation of your quartiles and quartiles are just special percentiles. So the 25th percentile, you know, 25 is one quarter of your data. So that's the lower quartile or sometimes called the first quartile or Q1. The median, right, is 50% of your data. So that's the second quarter, right? Two quarters makes 50, 50 cents. So that's Q2. And then the third quartile, third quarter, right? 75% of your data, also called the upper quartile or Q3. So this okay, is called a box. Said, Sorry? Because uh, this was one of the problems I was struggling with. The 28, I mean, okay. the 25th percentile is the lowest percentile? Yeah, this is the lower quartile. Q1, that's the 25th percentile. So 25% of your data is going to be below that value. Is that the same as the first quartile? I mean, like the first? Sometimes, yes. Yes, sometimes it's called the first quartile. Yes. But I got two different, when I did it in stats, I got two different numbers. For the first quartile? For the first. It just said first under additional. No, it wasn't additional statistics. Hey, give me a second. Um, it just says first under percentiles. Um, that might be percentiles. That might be the problem. Um, so, but the question you says, want to, yeah, see the first. The first would be the first percentile. That would be 1%. So that would give you the, the value that has 1% of your data. You want this one, lower quartile. That's the 25th percentile. Oh, got it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So it can be called the first quartile, but it wouldn't be called just the first because this would be first percentile, right? So there's a big difference between a percentile and a quartile because the first percentile is 1%. The first quartile is 25%. And then the, the whiskers, right? So sometimes this is called a box plot, sometimes it's called a box and whisker plot. The two whiskers just go out to the lowest value minimum, right? And the highest value or your maximum. And then they'll have what's called a modified box plot. And the modified box plot, the whiskers will stop at the lowest value that is not considered an outlier and the upper whisker will stop at the highest value that's not considered an outlier. So if you don't have any outliers in your um, data set, then they'll both look exactly the same because the lowest value you know, is, is not an outlier, so it goes to the lowest value, and the highest value is also not an outlier, so it goes to the highest value. But if you have outliers, it'll stop short of it. And then what it does is it just puts in either dots or asterisks. It depends on you know, what program you're running but it'll just put some little dots out here to let you know that you have an outlier and maybe you know one dot here. And so that would be a modified box plot. And these values would be considered the lowest value that isn't an outlier and the highest value that isn't an outlier. You might be asking yourself, well, what the heck is an outlier? Well, we'll talk about it here in a second, but it's, it's basically just things that are a certain distance away from the middle of your data. Now, one of the nice things about uh, the box and whisker plots is it can, it can tell you what the shape of your data is, right? If you have a, a box plot that's roughly symmetrical, right? The, the median is close to the middle of the box and the two whiskers are roughly the same size. Then you get a bell shape, right? But when you get something that looks like this, you can tell that it's really skewed, especially because these little dots, the little outliers, tell you that's going to be skewed way to the right. Dr. McBride, oh, yeah. uh, when you do a modified box plot, is it only the length of the whiskers that changes um, if yes. you denote yes. an outlier? It doesn't change the median? Nope, nope, because those things don't change whether you have an outlier or not. I didn't know if you like eliminated those to clean up the data somehow. <laughs> okay, well, that's a different question. Yes, if you go in and physically remove the outliers from your data set, then yes, of course, that, that could change your median and your quartiles, depending on how many outliers you removed. And it'll definitely affect the mean because anytime you take just one piece of data out of the data set, it's gonna affect the mean. So if you, if you had a set of data and you graphed 
just a regular box plot. And then you use the exact same set of data and you graphed the modified box plot. The only thing that would change would be the whiskers. Uh, the box itself would not change because all that's going to happen is this whisker is going to shrink from being all the way out here at this dot to where it is now and all the way out at this dot to where it is now when it you know doesn't show outliers versus does show outliers. However, if you are <clears throat> removing the data, quote unquote, cleaning it up by getting rid of outliers, which is something I recommend you never do, um, then yes, the, the box will change, the whiskers will change, the median will change, your uh, mean will change, your standard deviation will change, everything will change. What is the um, advantage to doing that? Um, well, sometimes people want to know um, the in, you know what's going on in your data without the influence of outliers. So that would be it. Um, and then, hold on a second, I can hear him. Okay, so um, yeah, so it, if you wanted to know what was kind of, you wanted to eliminate the influence of the outliers and see um, kind of a clearer picture of what the majority of your data looks like, then that would be one reason to get rid of them. I would never ever report the data with the outliers removed without also reporting all of your statistics with the outliers there. Because um, otherwise, it, it, it just seems a little shady. It seems like you're trying to hide something from the audience, right? The people who are going to be you know, looking at your results. Um, so it's a common practice. I mean, people remove outliers all the time, um, but good statisticians always report both so that you know, they're not trying to hide anything from you. The only time you would ethically want to remove an outlier uh, and completely remove it and not even consider it at all ever is if you knew it was a false piece of data, something that came from either a faulty instrument reading or, um, you know, somebody uh, typed in a number wrong or you, you, knew, you know that the data you got was, um, was wrong, you know. So, for instance, if you were recording uh, how long people could hold their breath and one person or, you know, one of your subjects, uh, the answer was written down as 600 seconds, you're like, well, there's no way in hell somebody could hold their breath for 600 seconds. That's 10 minutes. Now, of course, there are, you know, those um, free divers that probably could, but unless you had a free diver in your sample, I doubt it. And what had probably happened is instead of 60 seconds, whoever was typing in the data mistakenly typed in an extra zero. So you would eliminate that outlier um, as being, you know, kind of a quote unquote obvious mistake or false piece of data. Oh, yeah. Who goes first? <laughs> Go, I heard I heard a female voice first. Okay, okay this is Cherie. Um, I was working on um, I kind of finished my the mini project, and I went through and I did a box plot. Um, mine's is totally different from what you shown the first time. But when I Googled it, I saw ones like you. So, so can I show you my box plot that I, and you can just tell me what, what I did wrong? Um, sure. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn my, okay. I don't know. Let's see. Okay. Here it is. This is how mine with the side by side box plot. Um, go ahead and share your screen. Cause I can't see it in that tiny little window. Okay, so I, I was on my computer. I was on my computer and I'm actually on my phone doing the Zoom. But okay. the, my boxes are really oh. small. Yeah. Can you see that? I can barely see it. It doesn't look, it looks like it's doing box plots of your individual data. Just send me what you have via email and, and I'll take a look at it. Okay, got it. All right, who else? This is Wiley. Yeah, Wiley. Uh, I just wanted to ask, the uh, box plot is only used with the median, right? Well, the box plot is used for what's called the five number summary. It gives you minimum Q1, lower quartile, median mm -hmm. Q3 or the upper quartile and max. Those are your five numbers. So it's, it's just a visual representation of the five number summary. Okay. 
And so here is how we could relate the box plot to the normal curve, right? This is what it would look like to have um, the, the median. We know if it's perfectly normal, sits right in the middle, just like the mean does. And then we go at 25% in both directions. That's Q1 and Q3. And as you can see down I'm here- I'm not sharing your screen anymore. I am oh, sorry for no, no, interrupting. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Nope, thank you always. Sorry. So as you can see, if you go out to Q1 and Q3, the 25 in both directions, you're less than one standard deviation. Because remember, according to the empirical rule, if we go one full standard deviation, that's going to capture 34% and 34%. So that's why it's, you know, about two thirds of the way out. And then the, the other 25% goes all the way to the very end, because of course that has to be all of your data when you put all four of them together. Okay, questions on the box plots. Okay, looks like I got a chat window. Oh. Um, okay, scatter plots is the next kind of new display thing that you guys have to deal with this week. And I think probably most of you are already familiar with scatter plots, right? It's just a way of visually representing um, what's called binary data, data that has two measurements. So each dot represents one object, could be a person, could be anything else, but it represents one object that is measured two different ways. So on the left one, the objects are peaches, and the two measurements are how many were sold, and then the price of the said peach. And then on the right-hand side, the thing that's being measured is ice cream. And one measurement is the sales. Well, I guess it's, you're probably measuring maybe days and you have ice cream sales versus temperature because you don't have temperature of ice cream. So it looks like each one of those dots would represent uh, like a day, uh, a moment in time. And at that particular moment in time, you have a temperature and a number of ice cream sales, right? And so that's binary data. It's just things that have um, two measurements to them. And then the, the plot, the scatter plot, shows if there's any kind of relationship between those two things. And we can see from both of these that there's a decent relationship, right? As, as the um, price goes up, normally I would put price on the X because we kind of think of that as influencing the other one. So you, you, you think of the, the horizontal as being the input variable or what's called um, the uh, predictor and response, right? So you put this in and then it's supposed to kind of predict the response. Well, it doesn't make sense to say, hey, if I sell this many, the price is gonna be such and such. It's gonna be the other way around that if I price it at this, then I'm gonna sell that much. So I, I would have swapped this. Um, the correlation, of course, is going to be the same. And the graph would look the same. I mean, it would still have what this is called a negative correlation because as one number gets bigger, you can see the other number gets smaller, right? So as we start up here and head down, you can see that as we have more sales, we're having lower prices. And it would make more sense, I think, to say as prices go up, number of sales goes down. But anyway. Over here, you can see that as temperature goes up, sales go up, so it has a positive relationship. Um, between these two, peaches and ice cream, which one do you think would have a stronger correlation if we ran the numbers? Ice cream. Yes, very good. And it has nothing to do with them being positive versus negative. It has um, everything to do with how tightly the, the dots cluster along a straight line. And these are, are much more tightly clustered along a straight line, whereas these are, they still have a linear trend, but they're, it's a little wider, right? They're a little bit more spread out from where you can kind of visualize a line that would go through the middle of the data. And then of course we get to things like this that just have like almost no correlation whatsoever. You can see a, a slight positive trend here, but they're really starting to get spread out. And then these things are just all over the place. So this would have a correlation pretty close to zero, which brings us to kind of some standard uh, pictures of correlation, right? This is a pretty strong positive correlation, a pretty strong negative correlation. And then when you get buckshot like this, we know that there's just no correlation whatsoever. And I like to give, you know, kind of 
a, a wider view of that. When they're lining up perfectly in a line, then you get a correlation of negative one. Same thing here when they uh, line up perfectly in a line with a, a horizontal, sorry, with a positive slope, then we get a correlation of positive one. As they tend to kind of roam, right, get a little bit further away from this line, it's almost like the line gets wider, gets thicker. Then the correlation drops from one, it gets closer to zero. So now it's 0.8. Then as it gets wider, it's down to 0.4. And then, of course, when it goes to buckshot, we're at zero. Same thing in the other direction, right? When it's tight, perfect on the line, it's negative one. And as it gets wider and wider, it gets closer and closer to zero, only this time from the negative side. So as it gets pretty wide here, it's down to negative 0.3. Now, would, would you be expected to, you know, look at this and know what the correlation is? Heck no. You should just be able to look at it and know that this, is the, this one is stronger than this one is stronger than that one. And this one is stronger than this one, right? Barely, but you can see this is a bit more spread out. And then this is, of course, the worst. That would be the only thing that I would say, you know, from visually looking at it, you'd be expected to know. Uh, everything else, of course, you would use technology to figure the actual correlations out themselves. Okay. So that's, that's it for the, the new content this week that you're going to be dealing with in the homework and in the mini project. Speaking of the mini project, there are um, two parts to it. Part one is what you're doing this week. And then the second part is the um, article critique that you're doing next week. So those two things put together are supposed to be the whole mini project, but I kind of consider it this part, the mini project, and the other thing is a separate critique because they don't have to be related because they obviously can't be related unless you all go out there and find articles on blood pressure, right? But anyhow, um, this is how the school views it as, as, you know, two parts of one big thing. Of course, the mini project um, is due this Sunday, right? This is week three, so the end of this week. So Sunday, the same time as your homework is due. Um, don't worry about turning it in to turn it in. Um, that was an old thing that I don't deal with anymore. Um, and then submit it to the Canvas link, right? Just like you do with all the other stuff. Now, your um, critique, you do need to submit to turn it in. That's really the only thing that's submitted to turn it in. Um, and you want to get that submitted um, by Thursday, right? So you have to have your summary posted in the discussion by Thursday. Have your thing turned in to turn it in um, by Thursday. And then you have until the end of the week, basically Sunday, to post your two replies. You're supposed to read somebody else's summary and then reply uh, on it, you know, like point out something. Oh, hey, wow. Did you think about looking at this or, you know, da 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 da? You know, just make some sort of substantial uh, reply, not just great job, right? That's not moving the conversation forward. Okay. Um, questions on the bookkeeping part of the mini crop project or any of the lecture stuff that we've talked about? I have a question about the, um, the mini project. I, so when I uploaded my data, there was two things regarding the mini project as far as the data. Yes. Um, There's which BP, one? BP categorized. So how do we, it doesn't tell us which one to use for. So the I just use the new drug. Yeah. For all of them. The, for um, all the, the new drug data is what you use for every question except for the side by side box plot. Okay. Maybe that's why my side by side box plot don't look right. That's exactly why. Because the only <laughs> way to get a side by side box plot to work in SAS is to uh, recode your data. And rather than forcing all of you to recode your data, I created that second data set called BP categorized. Because in order to do a side-by-side -side, uh, box plot, you have to have all of your data under one variable name, and then you have to have um, a grouping variable. So I'll show you what the data looks like. In the BP categorized one, uh, you've got two variables. You've got BP and then BP cat for BP category. So under the BP variable is all of the blood pressure readings from the people both after and before. And then all I did was create this second variable. 
And so all of these readings came from the patients after they had the treatment. And then starting here at 51, these are all the before readings. And that's the only way to get a side-by-side -side box plot. Because if you try to do a side-by-side -side box plot um, without that grouping variable, it's gonna do what it did to you and basically put a box plot out there for like every value. It's, it's, it's just, it doesn't work, it's all wonky. Now there are ways to get side-by-side -side box plots in Excel and other programs without having to recode your data. Um, and this is a pretty easy recoding to do in Excel, but I didn't want, you know, you guys have to waste your time. And I see that unfortunately Amy already did that, sorry. Um, if you had happened to have seen some of my earlier videos, I would have mentioned this as well, but say la vie. Um, to do it now, to do your box plot, if you go to graph and box plot, and where was this one saved? I think it was just saved in one. Yeah. So I want to pick up, import. So the analysis variable is BP. And then the appearance, no, I think you just do it here. And then additional rules, yeah, there we go. Um, group analysis by, so you have your grouping variable and you use BP categorizing. And if you run that, you should get two of them next to each other. Nope, all right. Let's try that again. What was that? Let me say something. Let me try horizontal. Nope. All right. Where the heck did I put the? Uh, no, no, I don't want that one. Um, I got mine side by side. Now I'm trying to remember how. It I might be. Think maybe you put it in category. Category. So I'm thinking it must be category, which is why I named it BP category. Duh. There we go. Yeah. So you got to put it in category rather than uh, the grouping variable. So then you get it side by side. I always like my box plots horizontal if I'm going to compare them because it makes it easier to compare because, I mean, Box plots are supposed to represent numbers, right? And so they should be on a number line. So they should be horizontal, in my opinion. Um, but by looking at them, then you can very easily compare the, the after and the before and talk about the differences between those two groups. Okay, so that's, that's why that data set's there. It's literally only for that one question. Okay, um, what else? So um, where in, in this mini project part one, where it asked you to annotate the output um, to include interesting information and your interpretation, how much interpretation do you want? Do you want us to go deep into this or? No, just yeah, a couple just sentences, just describing, you know, every single output. You, you, okay. you, you do some tables and then mm -hmm. you describe, you know, any interesting things you see. Okay. Thank you. What else? Dr. McBride? Yes. Um, I, ha I had a question and it's not about the mini project. It's about the, um, I watched the correlation video that you had um, under the preparation for this week. Yeah. Um, and it was interpreting strong correlation versus weak correlation. Mm -hmm. And in the video, it said um, that you need to refer to tables. To, yeah, there, yeah, there are there are actual um, Pearson correlation tables that will tell you whether or not um, a correlation is actually significant based on your sample size. Okay. And and that that was so something, that's the, not the same as stronger week then that's significant. Correct. Exactly. Okay. Okay. There there are there are technically some some values out there that are cutoffs for strong, moderate, and weak or mild um, correlations, but there's no definitive rule as to what those cutoffs are. It tends to kind of go by field of study. 
the hard sciences will have a different set of numbers than the soft sciences. And even within the soft sciences, you know, sociology will have a different set than uh, education and things like that. So there's really no hard, fast rule on what's considered a weak, a moderate, or a strong correlation. It, it, it's, it's kind of, the lines are, are, are fuzzy. Because some people would consider, you know, 0.6 to be strong, whereas other people would consider 0.6 to be moderate, and other people would, in all honesty, would consider 0.6 to be mild or weak. So it, that's why I, I, I wouldn't get too bogged down in, in, the, in that wording. Really what matters are the things that can be strictly quantified and, and there's, there's no argument about it whatsoever. And that's just the correlation itself. I got 0.7, that's, that's the answer, that's, that's R. Um, and beyond that, you could also then you know, talk about the significance of it. And, and that does come from a, a table. Oh, correlation, correlation, significance, table. Yeah. So this is telling you that based on your sample size, now by sample size, it means um, number of pairs, right? So if you had a sample size of one, that means you have one pair of data, right? Basically one set of readings. So you took one person and you recorded their height and weight, right? In order for something to be significant um, at the point one, meaning a 10% error rate, and so alpha is 10%, you'd need a correlation of this. At 5%, you need a correlation of that, and 1%, you need a correlation of that. And you can see that as um, your sample size goes up, the strength of your correlation goes down drastically in order for something to be considered significant. Now, 5% is usually, is kind of the, I wouldn't say the gold standard, but it's the most frequently used um, alpha level, level of error. So meaning that you're 95% confident in your results. So this column, this middle column here is the most commonly used significance level. And you can see that, you know, a, a correlation below 7.7 7 is considered significant already as long as you have seven pairs of data or more. Um, you know, usually you're going to have at least 20, maybe even 40 pieces of data. You only have to get a correlation of 0.3 to say it's significant. Well, yeah, but here's the thing. Don't mistake significance with strength. Significance just means that, yeah, Statistically speaking, we can say with 95% certainty that these two things are related. However, they're related pretty weakly, right? Um, so, so that's the idea of significance levels. It just tells you whether or not the correlation is strong enough in relationship to the size of your data for you to be able to take the risk basically go out on a ledge and say, I'm fairly certain these things are in fact related, that it wasn't just a glitch in the data. Because that's really what it means, you know, to have significance. It means that, that you can kind of, you know, put your reputation on the line and say, I'm 95% confident in my results that they're actually telling me what I think they're telling me. And it's not due to some random error that could have happened. So that's, that's what that table is referring to, and, and we don't use okay. it in this class. Okay. How does, if you have one data point, how is it not on the line? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's kind of silly, isn't it? Gone. Okay. I was like, am I, am I yeah. like crazy? Or no. is that <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would, you would have to have a, a, a correlation of one for one data point. And I don't know why they even show a table of that, because really you shouldn't have, because even two data sets, right, or two pieces of data always determine a line. So they would always have a, a perfect correlation of one. So you really would have to have um, a set of three or more before you really can test for correlation at all. Okay, what else? I have a question on the homework number three. 
Okay. Uh, thing is, uh, the one that has uh, the standard deviation of five groups and the standard deviation of all of them together. And how to go, you know, one of the question is, I think it's, uh, which one? Three yeah, 3.56. Yeah, the question I have, so all of those groups have a different number of members. Yes. So how does that influence it, trying to get an estimate from the, the individual standard deviations to estimate the group standard deviation? Okay, so um, the first thing to realize is that um, you're computing for each, right? Mm -hmm. And then for part B, you're actually computing the standard deviation for the whole set. So you're just basically take, excuse me, taking the grouping variable away. So there's no estimation whatsoever. Now, part C asks you to describe a method by which the standard deviation for the combined data set could be obtained from the five individual standard deviations. So this is very similar to the question we did last week where we had the means of five different groups and then it said hey describe a method where you could you could get the mean of the entire set of data from these five group means and we talked about oh that's easy it's a weighted mean all you got to do is take the mean of the first group multiply it by its group size its frequency right and then take the second one do the same thing multiply its mean by its its frequency its group size do all that add those all together and then divide by the the cumulative total frequency that gives you what's called a weighted mean, and that gives you the, the exact same thing as the mean of the group. It, it's, it's an accurate measurement. Well, they're kind of trying to get you to you know, think, well, I can do the same thing here, right? I can take my standard deviation, I can multiply it by my, my sample size, and I can do all those, I can add them all together, and I can divide my sample size. Nope, totally wrong. Not even close yeah. to what the real standard deviation is. Um, you could then, you know, think about how the standard deviation formula works and you could kind of okay. un unwind it a little bit and think about, oh, well, if I took everything and then squared it, that would give me the variance. And then the variance is divided by the sample size minus one. So if I multiply it by the sample size minus one, that gets me back to this like summation thing. So then if I added all those together, that would give me like a big summation. And then I could just divide by the whole sample size divided by one. And that'll give me a rough estimate. And it'll still be wrong, but it's about as close as you could get, mm -hmm. um, you know, with okay. that kind of method. Um, so I think all, all that that question is trying to get you guys to understand is that there's no such thing as a weighted standard deviation. There's no such okay. thing as a weighted anything other than a weighted mean. Yeah, because my I, I was going if well if I assume that all of them are a normal distribution, fine. I mean, all the bell curves should be more or less on top of each other. Yeah. And you know, can I take an average of those? But it's it's never going to be close. It's no. always off. Yeah, it's all it's it's it's, okay. it's 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 yes, it's terribly off for sure. All right, thank you. Yep. All right, what else? Um, I guess, oh, sorry to keep asking so many questions. No, you're fine. Um, so um, I was working on the mini project and I did the scatter plot for BP before and BP after. And um, I probably went away too deep, but it's a mess because you've got data points that have the placebo and the, the drug, they're all mixed together in the same scatter plot. And so I grouped them and did a different, you know, so I'm probably putting way too much time and energy into this, trying to make meaning of this. Yes. Um, I'm going down a rabbit hole, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. Don't overthink it. I mean, it, you literally just take, just take the, um, you know, the so it's going to be a mess. I mean, the <laughs> after and, and run a scatter plot of, of those two it's going to have a, a horrible correlation. Horrible. They're both horrible. Hor horrible. Yeah. yeah, they're both horrible. Yeah. <laughs> but that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, there, there shouldn't be a correlation between your BP before and your BP after other than a, a mildly weak um, one, because sure, it's the same person, but they're all going to react uh, radically differently, you know, to the experiment, like you said, based on whether they got the placebo or not too. Um, and then, And then, of course, there should not be really any correlation between your blood pressure and your age. So that's why that one has a horrible correlation as well. 
And I thought that actually spoke to the strength of the study that it wasn't biased by right. taking a certain age group and, you know, and trying yeah. to make the drug look better than, right. it, than it is. Okay. Yeah. That's great. That's great. That's a great point. You could then say that, you know, age is not going to be a confounding variable. It's not going to have an influence on this because as we can see, BPs are all over the place uh, and with, you know, no correlation to age. Thank you. I was just like, oh my gosh, they're both a mess. Am I supposed yeah, to yeah, interpret yeah, both, something both out of horrible. this? Yeah, okay. Yeah. They're terrible. <laughs> but I'm glad you, you know, I'm glad you brought this up because, and as you so astutely pointed out, a bad or a strong, I'm sorry, a bad or a weak correlation is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a good thing. It can actually kind of prove what you're trying to prove, right? Or it can, it can kind of help val uh, validate lend some validity to what you're doing. And like you said, it, it helps to kind of show that the, the experiment is valid and, and what they're doing uh, you know, is, is a good measure because age is not going to be a factor. And, and, and this also, guys, people, folks, um, when you start running hypothesis tests later on in your statistical career, and you get, you know, you'll get an answer where you either reject the null or you fail to reject the null. And it all, it's all based on, you know, whether or not things are statistically significant or not. Students have this false preconception that unless they're able to reject the null and get that significant result, they've done something wrong or, you know, it's just it's not good. Sometimes no result is a good result, right? Sometimes failing to reject is a good thing. So don't think of statistics in absolutes. You don't always want to reject. You don't always want a significant result. You know, you don't always want a strong correlation. Um, let the data do what the data is supposed to do and then interpret the results afterwards. I think when, when statisticians go into something hoping for a certain type of result, that's when they start you know, manipulating data and massaging things and, and getting results that they want to get rather than the results that they actually got. And that's why you know, people are so skeptical of statistical results these days. What else? Can I Wow. Uh, Jessica? Can I ask a question about the, um, sorry, what is it next week? The part two of this project. Yeah, the article critique. Yes. Yeah, so do you want it written? Like, are we just answering the questions or do you want us to write a paper for the discussion? I guess I'm not quite clear what I'm, how you want these done. You're basically doing like a lit review summary. Okay. So it's just like answering each question. I don't have to have like no. a bunch before it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh huh. Okay, I have a question about the, uh, is it called Pareto analysis? Pareto chart, yeah, uh huh. Yeah, so when I looked at other ones to make sure that mine was like similar, they had numbers on each side of the chart, but mine don't have numbers on each side of the chart, like on the, the left side and the right side. The only thing that makes a bar chart a Pareto chart is that the bars are ordered from tallest to shortest. Everything else is just a formatting issue. So the only okay. thing you have to make sure yours has in order for it to be a Pareto chart is that your bars are lined up so that the tallest one is on the left and then they go down next tallest, next tallest, next tallest, all the way to the shortest. Okay, makes sense, got yeah. it. Okay. And then and then I have one more question. This is my, I promise y'all, this is my last one. On the homework three, mm -hmm. on for the one that's uh, 330, yeah. do, for, B, for B and C, do we have to like manually calculate this stuff? No, no, just use summary statistics in, in SAS. And it's just the regular mean that they're asking for. Yeah, the regular mean and the regular standard deviation. Yep. And, and for B, I don't have to do anything because I think it's confusing me because it's the with the diameter 
exceeding 12 inches for all 50 times 50 squares in the track. Oh, they're just talking about how the data was collected. So for instance, this first number seven comes from, oh, let's read 50 by 50, um, comes from the first, oh, those became threes. Um, so what they did is they went out in the forest and they, they basically did a grid pattern and they took a big you know, area of trees and they gridded it off into 50 by 50 foot squares, basically 2,500 square feet, 50 by 50 foot square. And then within each of those 50 by 50 foot squares, they went around and measured the diameter of every single tree. And they kind of took little, little tick marks, little tally marks for diameters. And what they did is any time a tree had a diameter that exceeded 12 inches, they would put a little mark, tick. And they just basically, they're counting mature trees. They're counting how many trees are 12 inches or wider. So this first number seven means in that first set of land, that first 50 by 50 patch of forest, they found seven trees with diameters that were more than 12 inches. So this is just giving you a context of what these numbers mean. And so when you calculate the sample mean, you're literally just calculating the mean of all these numbers. Let's say your, your, your average comes out, let's say your mean comes out to be 5.7. That just means that on average, there were 5.7 trees with diameters of, 12, of more than 12 inches in each of your 2,500 square foot plots. That's all it means. Okay, so for C, is the S the standard deviation? Yes. Yeah, S always represents standard deviation of a sample. So this is saying, take the mean and add and subtract one standard deviation. This is saying, take the mean and add and subtract two standard deviations. And this is saying, take the mean and add and subtract three standard deviations. And that should remind you of something. And we can't do that in say, so we have to do that yeah, you have to do that by hand or, you know, in Excel or whatever. But yeah, SAS, SAS, you can do number manipulations in SAS, but you would have to code it and it's not worth your time. It's easier just to, like you said, either do it by hand with a calculator or do it in Excel or whatever. But yeah. And then you're supposed to... Um, compare each of these results, right? You count, count the percentage of squares following in each of the three intervals. So once you have an interval, you go up here and you count how many of your pieces of data are in that interval. And then you divide by 50, I think there's 50 total measurements. How many total, well, however many total there are. And, oh, 70, so you divide by 70. And that gives you a percentage. And then you count up how many are in the second interval which of course is going to include all of the ones that were in the first, because you're just going to have a wider interval. And then you divide that by 70, and then you do the same thing with third one, you divide that by 70, you get three percentages, and then you're supposed to compare those percentages with the empirical rule, right? So you go, so like you do the first one, and it comes out to be 62%. You go, oh, well, that's pretty close to 68, right? And then you do the second one, and it comes out to be 92%. You go, yeah, that's pretty close to 95. And then you do the third one, and the third one comes out to 98%. You go, yeah, that's pretty close. You go, okay, so all three of mine were pretty close to the empirical rule. So that means that my data is probably fairly bell-shaped, right? It's got a, a pretty good normal shape to it. Or you run the data, you know, the first one says 40, and the next one says 60, and the last one says 70 or something. You're like, well, those are way off, so obviously my data doesn't have a normal bell curve distribution to it. That's all that you're doing with that question. Okay, so we have, when I do this math on this second part for C, I have to go in and the mean plus 
the standard deviation and then the mean minus the standard deviation. So I have to do two problems. No, no, no. So let's say, let's say you take your data and you calculate it and you get a mean. I don't know why they use Y instead of X, but let's just say you get a mean of 10. So that means within all of those um, pieces of land, there were an average of 10 trees with a diameter of 12 inches or more. And then you calculate the standard deviation. The standard deviation comes out to two. Well, the first one they want you to do the mean plus and minus the standard deviation. So you go 10 plus two, 10 minus two. And so your first interval is eight to 12. So now you go through your data and you count up how many of them are between eight and 12. Now, remember, this is a round bracket. So if you had an eight, you wouldn't count it. You would literally only count nine through 11. Now, obviously these are all gonna have decimals, you know, so it's, it's gonna be easier to figure that out, but still realize that because these, these intervals are round brackets, you don't count the endpoints. So let's say it came to be, you know, 7.3 to 12.2. Well, since your data is, is consistent of all whole numbers, you wouldn't count sevens, right? Because it has to be seven above 7.3. So you would only count eight, nine, tens, elevens, and twelves because it goes to 12.2, right? So you would count up how many of these you have, divide that by 70, and that would give you your first percentage. For the second one, where they want you to go plus or minus two, well, now it's just 10 plus four and 10 minus four, right? Because you go two times two and two times two. So that interval is gonna be from six to 14. And then you do the same thing, count up how many are in that interval, divide by 70, blah, blah, blah. And then for the last one, plus and minus three of them, you're just gonna go 10 plus six, 10 minus six. And now you get an interval of four to 16. You count up how many are in that, divide by 70, you get your third percentage. That's what you're doing. Okay, got it, thank you. Yep. Eduardo? Nothing for me, I'm good, thank you. Oh, I just saw your microphone was on, so I thought you wanted to ask a question. No, I'm, I'm diving, I'm, I gotta go and pick up my son for soccer practice, so just in case I need to say something. Gotcha, no worries. Okay, thank anybody you. else? All right. Um, we're going to end a few minutes early then, and um, I'll just say this, make sure that you get going on your work as quick as possible this week, right? Because you got those two things, both the homework and the mini project. So come Thursday, uh, I'm expecting you guys to have your questions ready for both. And we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about on both the homework and the mini project. And um, as always, you can send your homework for review, but I do not review mini projects and I do not re review the final project. Those are on your own. Okay. All right, any last questions? Can, hi, Dr. Um, McBride, I'm sorry. Yeah, Brandy. Um, so real quick, um, my kid was screaming when you were going over the timetable as far as when everything was due. Can you just reiterate on that one more time for me, please? Yeah, so um, the, the mini project is due this Sunday at the same time as your homework, right? So the mini project is due Sunday at midnight Eastern time, just like the homework uh, set three. The kind of quote unquote second half of the mini project that the school um, you know, considers to be the, the other part, which is the, um, the article critique that's due a week from Thursday. That's, that's in week four. Okay, that's why I got confused that I was like, wait, that's due Thursday too? What? No, ne next, next, next Thursday. So uh, Thursday the 9th is when that one is due. Okay. Right. And that's the only thing you guys are gonna turn in to turn it in. So make sure you write everything up, send it to turn it in, and then copy and paste it into your um, discussion post. And then upload the right. Word document to Canvas. Well, I guess when you put it through turn it, it puts it into Canvas for you. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? All right, folks, um, enjoy the rest of your night. Get going on that work, and I'll see you all Thursday.
All right. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank have you. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks.